right, picking back up with the plasma membrane. So last week we talked about passive transport mechanisms in which the cell does not require energy in order to transport materials. This week, however, we're going to be diving into active transport and bulk transport processes, which both use and require cellular energy in the form of ATP. One big difference between passive and active transport is that in active transport we're moving against the concentration gradient, which is why we need this energy in order to make these transports happen. The two main types of active transport are primary active transport and secondary active transport. So I'll talk about those in a second, but first we need to establish a knowledge of these this electrochemical gradient. So we've talked in the past about how there is a charge difference at the plasma membrane and this is due to a different number of ions moving from the extracellular environment to the intracellular environment and vice versa. Cells are typically more negatively charged than their environments because there there tends to be more sodium leaving than there is potassium coming in. So we're losing more of the more cations to the extracellular environment than we're bringing back in and replacing them with. So that accounts for that charge difference. So working against this gradient, we're going to use pumps that work against the electrochemical gradients. And as we've previously said, there are these channels or pumps that work in passive transport as well, but these require energy as they're moving against the gradient. Because they need to harness the energy from metabolic processes, they tend to be very sensitive to metabolic poisons that interfere with our ATP supply. So without this ATP supply in cases of metabolic poisons, it can be difficult for these processes to happen. There are three different types of proteins that are used as carrier proteins or pumps for active transport. These are also used in facilitated diffusion, but in those cases without ATP as they are not moving against the gradient. So our, two our three types are uniporter, so it's carrying one specific ion or molecule across the membrane. Symporter is carrying two in the same direction, and antiporter is carrying two but in different directions. So primary active transport, we're using energy to move ions and molecules across the plasma membrane. It's moving ions across the membrane, it's creating that electrochemical gradient as potassium moves into the cell and sodium moves out simultaneously. So it's considered a, an electrogenic pump because of that charge imbalance it creates. Three sodium are going out for every two potassium in. So since we're not replacing that cation inside the cell, that accounts for that gradient. This is called the sodium-potassium pump, sometimes called the sodium-potassium ATPase pump. So the steps in which this occurs, there's a carrier protein that has an affinity and really likes the sodium ions and it binds three of them. It then hydrolyzes ATP and releases a phosphate group. So we used ATP and created ADP with the release of the phosphate group for energy. The carrier protein will change shape, moves to the cell's exterior, its affinity for sodium will decrease, and sodium will leave the cell. At that same time, it has an increased affinity for potassium ions. Two will attach, the protein moves to the interior of the cell, it has a decreased affinity for potassium ions, so the potassium enters the cell, and it keeps and it continues to repeat. So here's a picture showing that occurring. Secondary active transport is also known as co-transport, and I know that I said active transport requires energy to, to occur, but secondary active transport does not directly require energy. It does require energy, just does not directly require it. So usually secondary active transport will be hitching a ride on a primary active transport process. So it will use the energy that's established from that first electrochemical gradient, and use that to kind of fund it, processes that are happening. So now we're moving into bulk transport. 
This is still a type of active transport, uh, so it's still requiring energy. It's moving large particles into the cell. In both cases of phagocytosis and pinocytosis, both types of endocytosis, the cell membrane will invaginate or create a little pocket. It will surround the particle that it's trying to bring into the cell. The pocket will pinch off as a vesicle, and then the vesicle will either fuse with a lysosome to break down the particle and use it for energy or fuel, or it will bring that particle or liquid that it's bringing into the cell to its appropriate organelle for processing. So with phagocytosis, this means cell eating. So during phagocytosis, this cell membrane becomes coated, coated with clathrin, which is a protein that helps to stabilize the membrane. The vesicle, once it forms and pinches off from the plasma membrane, will merge with a lysosome. I know this says vacuole, ignore that, it means vesicle. It will merge with a lysosome. The lysosome will break all of the materials down, the nutrients will be ex extracted, and then the rest will be destroyed. Similarly in pinocytosis, this is cell drinking, so it's taking in large amounts of extracellular fluid, and they used to think that it was specifically for water, but cells are actually trying to bring in molecules that are trapped in the water. So in this case, a lysosome does not have to attach to the vesicle to break it down, and the vesicles tend to be a lot smaller than those in phagocytosis. In podocytosis, this is a variation of pinocytosis, it's going to use the protein caviolin to coat the plasma membrane a lot like clathrin, and it forms vesicles and vacuoles, but things that are a lot smaller. It performs transcytosis, so it's going to take molecules into the cell and move them all the way across the cell to be released on the other side. In receptor-mediated endocytosis, this is a variation of endocytosis, there's very specific receptors. They also use clathrin to coat the membrane to support it. Receptor-mediated endocytosis is extremely important in living organisms because it is so specific to these different molecules. Um, without it, a lot of diseases may occur, things like hypercholesterolemia. It can also lead, lead to flu viruses, diphtheria, and the cholera toxin. So with endocytosis, endo means within, so we're bringing things into the cell. Exocytosis, X means out, so we're taking things and transporting them out of the cell. Also a type of active transport, we're doing exactly the opposite of what was happening prior. So large particles are going to be expelled from the cell. An example is neurotransmitters, so at the end of each neuron, there's a synaptic bulb. They have neurotransmitters, which are a chemical that kind of act like hormones but they communicate with other cells, sometimes other neurons, sometimes muscle cells, um, or other different types of cells, <clears throat> to create a specific function. And here's a recap of all the transport mechanisms we talked about this week and last week. So let me know if you have any questions on those, and you can move on to the next lecture.